Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode of the Dairy Edge, milk specialist Don Crowley considers the dry cow options for your herd and first explains why selective dry cow therapy is becoming so important. Traditionally, what farmers would have been doing was a, a, an approach called blanket dry cow therapy, which meant every cow within my herd and every quarter would have got an antibiotic pre- preparation plus or minus uh, sealer. What selective dry cow means is that a proportion of my herd will get antibiotics plus or minus a sealer and a proportion of my herd will get sealer only, no antibiotic. So that's selective drying off. I'm selectively picking out a bunch of animals that are going to get internal teat seal only with no antibiotic and a selective group of my herd will get antibiotics only. And as you mentioned, as standard, farmers used to use antibiotics across the board on every cow, on every teat. So, you know, why are we looking at this idea of selective dry cow? I suppose under European legislation, which is due to be enacted, to be ratified by the nation, by every country, by January 2022, Blanket use of antibiotics as a preventative means to prevent for prophylactic use, that's a means to prevent infection coming into the other, is going to be outlawed. So what in, basically what they're meaning from the point of view of drawing off a cow, when you have a cow with a cell count of 20, 30, 40, 50,000, say, that's a non-infected qua- cow, and you cannot justify putting an antibiotic into that quarter to prevent infection. So you're using the antibiotics to cure an infection cider, not to use it as a preventative. So that's why the legislation is being enacted to help prevent antibiotic antimicrobial resistance and to reduce the usage of antimicrobials as, as well within the national herd. Some farmers are using an antibiotic plus or minus a sealer. Is it recommended to use a teat sealer? There has been a lot of work done internationally on comparing antibiotics two antibiotics plus an internal teat seal. And there's enough data to say that the internal teat seal is offering a huge advantage to mitigate against environmental mastitis, which will occur in the first three weeks after I dry off the cow and in the three weeks coming up to calving. So when you remove the antibiotics from it, the internal teat sealer then is a huge crutch to have to mitigate against any mastitis that could happen during the dry period. The biggest issue with the internal teat seal is the level of hygiene that's required in administering that teat seal. Because I have an uninfected cow, I'm going to administer an internal teat seal. And if I don't do that hygienically enough, I will actually infuse infection. I'll do more harm than good. I could potentially, if I don't do it right. And and I suppose the limitations there, hygiene is a big one. Is there anything else that you're seeing, you know, that, that can compromise the, the um, you know, other health and putting in uh, bacteria into the other? I suppose the, the two things is number one, is there an infection inside there already? Am I sealing a cow that should be getting an antibiotic? So that's the threshold of the cows that you're picking at. So we would be advising farmers maybe to start the bar low or high, whatever way you look at it, that's an average of 50,000 for the year with no count over 200,000. That means that no quarter will be over 200,000. No more packers are doing a lot of work to see can you push that up to 200,000 threshold. But the second thing is if, if it is an uninfected cow, the only way that that cow can get infected then is hygiene. Hygiene, hygiene, hygiene is the crucial thing. Really, if, if, if the teat end is disinfected properly and prepared properly and an adequate time given, there's no... There's no risk. You're mitigating against the risk hugely, hugely. And if we can put ourselves in the shoes of farmers, Don, and, you know, they're listening into us today and saying, well, is this selective dry cow therapy for me? Like, what are the steps they can take? You know, you're talking about records and I suppose knowledge is key um, to making these decisions. But what exactly should they be looking at? If we start first and we say what cows are suitable, we'll start with that first. So... A cow that got a case of clinical mastitis during the lactation, she's ineligible. A cow that's a free milker or that has warts at the end of the teeth, any abnormality like that, she would be ineligible. <clears throat> then if we look at the criteria from you going to ICBF, into your milk recording, you go down to profiles, you go to milk profile SCC, 
and that ranks your, your all your herders there with all the somatic cell counts <clears throat> and along the top bar there you will see a filter system and you if you put in 50,000 as an average for the lactation with no count over 200,000 during the different milk recordings then I have my list of my cows that are averaging under 50,000 for the year with no count over 200. The biggest thing with that is my last milk recording cannot be greater than 30 days from drying off. And that's what's catching a lot of farmers with the four times a year milk recording. So that's my batch of cows picked out. The next thing then is the actual procedure. From now on, what people should really be doing is clipping tails. Get it's high. If you think of it, if you look at two hygienic eyes, you say, right, I must clip the tails. That means the hocks, the other, the tail. The cow herself is going to be in a lot cleaner state. Some farmers are flaming others or clipping others just to get that hair in that again is cleaning the environment then when i'm looking at the feedback we're getting from farmers is if i'm drying off it's a selective dry cow group or an antibiotic and sealer group that is one or the other don't mix them the group size is important depending on help 10 to 20 max you know is two rows of a parlor is, is max and you it's a two person job at minimum if not three or four and then you're looking We've seen in Moore Park, they use the cotton buds with methylated spirits, 30 cotton buds into a Ziploc bag, put a half litre methylated spirits into it, mix it up. Fantastic as a disinfectant tool for cleaning the end of the teats. I administer my sealer. I'm trying to ensure that it's I'm, I'm holding in the teat itself when the cow is finished. You need your head torch. That's another thing I forgot to mention. A head torch is fantastic from the point of view of just no shadows and stuff within the parlor itself. Two sets of gloves after five cows, peel off one set. If you put on two pairs of gloves on your hand, you can peel off one set after uh, after five cows. I have a new gown. I'm getting farmers to try and buy a new gown now for drying off so that I'll have it for the start of next lactation. And it's all linking back into the hygiene that's there. And once the cows are dried off, they stand in the yard for half an hour to an hour just to let the sealer bed down or to let the let the teats close. You mentioned the your last milk recording in the year and in the lactation must be done within 30 days of dry off. So, you know, essentially, you know, a lot of farmers will milk record in early to mid-October and essentially that isn't sufficient for cows that are going to be dried off in December. Like so, th- is the recommendation to go in 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 mid to late November and do an additional recording? Absolutely, yeah, well, Liz. Um, so you have two options. You go and you can pay one euro fifty for an extra milk recording. Let's say I'm on four times a year. I need an extra milk recording. <clears throat> They'll charge you one euro fifty for that extra milk recording done in the middle of November, and that is crucial. If there's if there's only a proportion of my herd left, let's say there's 20, 30 percent of my herd to be left to be dried off. So what some farmers are doing is just individually cell counting those cows and send them into their cooperative to get an individual cell count on them. And that may be a stopgap for some people. But ideally, the extra milk recording would be the way to go. But d- definitely no more than 30 days. And if we look for the, you know, the average herd in the country has 90 cows done and like that, that is less than 150 euro for a milk recording. So, you know, it, it's not a huge financial outlay for the benefits it can incur, um, you know, in the subsequent lactation. Um, and, and, and moving on then, you mentioned the help done and we, we would have looked at it here um, in terms of how long it actually takes to physically dry off a cow. And it can take anywhere between, you know, five and eight minutes. So that's a considerable amount of time. And, you know, if we look at it across an hour, you know, you're going to get somewhere between nine and 12 cows done. Yeah. And you see, I mean, this is all coming back to the group sizes and stuff. So if I'm facing into 50, 60 cows are drying off, the pressure then is throughput. So the, the time per cow is going to be compromised. And that's what we're seeing at family when we look back at where pace cases are not doing as well as they should be. So that's why it's coming back to the group sizes of your 20 cows because you're taking that's potentially, you know, that's a two hour job, two and a half hour job. And like this is, you know, if you've cows hanging around for that, for that length of time, they'll get unsettled, they'll get agitated, they'll incline to dung more, the operator gets tired human nature there's more things likely to go wrong 
will the last co be done as good as the first co? And these are the issues. When I think the biggest thing for people to realize is antibiotic blanket, antibiotic preparation has allowed us to get away with practices that are not suitable for selective only. The antibiotic is killing infections that we are administering when we're doing our procedure. If you remove antibiotics from that, now we're, it's a different ball game. Now we have no, we have no crutch to fall back on. So we have to up our game and considerably, hugely. And I think that's a big thing that farmers have to try and realise. And and then taking it uh, taking in another point that you made, Don, you talked about where you have a clinical case of mastitis in the year. Uh, you know, a cow would not be suitable for um, selective dry cow therapy. Um, how, how good are farmers at recording incidents of mastitis? Like I know that if you look at at many ICBF reports, you'll see that there was no clinical case within the year. But are farmers keeping good records with paper and pen method? No, the reality it is very poor, very poor. And and the technology is there to do it very easy. Especially, I mean, it's like most the farmers will be using the small white book that ICBF portray. And if they looked at the back page and that, there's an 089 number, 089457663, where if I had a code mastitis, I'd go CO65 with a space and just type mast, M-A-S-T, text off that number to automatically populate um, my milk recording data with a mastitis case for that cow. And if we got into the habit of that, no, there's websites and there's apps and there's everything as well in that, but even the simple thing of a text message to that, it's a fantastic tool. And when we're going on selective dry cow, the clinical cases of mastitis has to be recorded because we've seen too many cases where the cell count is actually very good but in a four times a year milk recording, a cow could get a case of clinical mastitis cure and she's back low at the milk recording. So it's not, it isn't as if her cell count is impacted on it. So she could have four very good cell counts, but she could be after one or two cases of clinical mastitis and they're crucial to us. You mentioned uh, during the conversation that you would do um, a culture and sensitivity analysis of the herd. Just go- going through it, in terms of taking those samples, um, do we take them now? Is there other times that you'd recommend us to take those samples to make an informed decision about the a suitable antibiotic to use? No, is the time. Now is a great time to do it um, for your culture and sensitivity because we'll have it back in adequate time so that we our vet can make a call on what antibiotic will be the most appropriate. Um, if you're considering selective drico, which we will be, a, a culture and a sensitivity needs to be done every year. Because what we were trying to watch for is just that it is a bacteria called Strepagalactia that we want to make sure is not in the herd if we're considering selective trico. Um, then, you know, if you're coming back to the evidence based approach, so the veterinary surgeon will require evidence to state number one, why I need to give you a, what antibiotic to give you and why I should be giving you blanket trico. These are the the things that you need to, to help with this. And if, if we could, if farmers could remember to take a sample of cows that got clinical cases of mastitis, put the cow number and the date and freeze them, they're a great part of information to have that you could submit to the laboratory for culture and sensitivity. And and how long would those samples last? Like I'd say, if, if we were to have a case of mastitis in May, June, is it sufficient to use those um, those samples to make a decision for the herd in November, December time? Yeah, definitely. The, the general consensus is six months they'll last for. But the, the crucial thing with these samples is, is if you think about it, we're trying to get the bacteria that's within the other of the cow, not that's in the whole environment. So that's why hygiene is so crucial. So you have your sterile bottle, you pre wipe spray your cows, you disinfect the base of the teeth, you hold the bottle at an angle outside the rump rail so there's no dirt falling from the cow itself, and you go to third fill the bottle. You have a jug of warm water or ice water that you take your sample and you immediately pop it into the fridge or keep it cool as fast as you can until you get in home. You put it into the fridge and you get that to the laboratory as fast as you can then. In terms then, you've mentioned a, a strain of mastitis um, that, that some of us mightn't have heard of before and we'll get back to that. But in terms of looking at results from culture and sensitivity, 
what strains of mastitis are we typically seeing, um, you know, where we're doing sensitivity at this time of year? Um, if you were asking that question about three, four, five years ago, Staph aureus was the dominant bug inside it. As cell counts have improved and improved dramatically, that has uh, reduced a lot to about, say, 30, 40% of the cases. And Strep uberus is the most common one, now, I'd say, at maybe 50, 60% of the cases. So as your cell count improves, different bugs will dominate the culture. So the two, the two main ones are Staph aureus and Strep uberus, with the very, very rare case of a Strep agalactia. And we, we've heard, like we, we've all heard at different times of the Staph aureus and Strep uberus, but this Strep agaglactica is a new one. Um, why are we talking about this now, Don? Well, Strep agaglactica is a contagious bug that can cause a dramatic rise in, in um, cell count. It's very rare in the national herd because of our approach at drying off has been blanket dry cow. So that has been controlling it. As we move to more selective Drico, there's a risk that its prevalence could increase. It could increase. So we don't know until the thing goes forward. So all we're doing is put it out there that people are aware of it. The veterinary surgeons are aware of it and they're keeping an eye on it. And that's the important thing about the culture and sensitivity that you know when I'm going to selective that strep agalactia isn't in my heart. In terms then of strep agalactica, if you have that, what is the procedure for the herd for this year? blanket trico across the herd with a sealer and that will sort it out. And just taking a step forward, where we're going to use selective dry cow therapy in our herds, you know, consistently across a number of years, what is the, um, you know, what is the expectation? Are we going to see a slight rise in somatic cell count before we get a full handle on this done? I suppose being realistic, you I mean, would have to say yes. Um See, I suppose there's a huge culture change required, a massive uptake in milk recording needed, education in, ter- in interpretation of those records, um, uh, highlighting the, the absolute critical need for hygiene at dry off. So there's a complete mindset has to be changed to that. And the problem with this is when it's wrong, the consequences are for a full lactation afterwards. So it's a very important crutch that's being removed from us at the dry period. So we have to look at where we're weak. And that's where the milk recording comes in. Like in the cell check farm summary page, if farmers look at the bottom of page two there, it says the new infection rate from my last dry co period. So it tells me how good I was. And if that's very high, if I have a lot of newly infected cows after the last dry period, and that was with an antibiotic, it means my approach isn't hygienically enough. I actually infected those cows with my technique. So then I need to address that. But you know that it's an issue because you have milk recording. So for our clients that don't have milk recording, they're at, a, they're at a big disadvantage. The data is there to tell us what the technique we're doing. It's just we need to be able to interpret it. And number one, do milk recording. So anyone out there that's not milk recording, for God's sake, start as soon as you can. It's it's crucial because we've uh, basically, we've had, three dry cow periods left with blanket dry cow. A couple of things that you mentioned, um, cotton buds and methylated spirits. You know, we do get wipes with the dry cow tubes. So, the, you know, wipes come within within the box and that. They're not sufficient, are they? You see, like to be fair to the companies, they're a fantastic tool. They're alcohol-based wipes and there's one for every quarter that's there. But in the procedure and trying to open them and get them out of the packet, there's a, a significant risk in contaminating them before I even touch the cow. So what we found, and we've seen this with Moorpark and the, the vets in Moorpark when they're doing this, they rely, they've moved completely to the cotton wool buds and the methylated spirits. And the feedback from farmers is extremely positive because number one, they're more bulky. Number two, is a lot easier to use. There's a, a way less risk of contamination. And um, it's just the medicated wipes and just in in the environment and trying to open them up within a parlour and that many cows around you. It's it's very hard to do that hygienically. And the cotton buds and methylated spirits, it's extremely cost effective. A roll of cotton wool is about four euro, five euro. A gallon drum of methylated spirits is about 20 euro. So, and 
it's a, and it definitely the feedback is extremely positive Anna. and and your final tip John you mentioned to wear say two sets of gloves on the hand and that's just I suppose a time effective way of changing gloves and keeping things hygienic Jeez, and I, I think there's two issues I just, of course we pick these ideas up from farmers themselves and we see them go around and like as one farmer said to me if the two pairs of gloves are on you from the start after five you'll just pull them off because it's not a big deal and they don't impede your your you know the motion of your hand you know your mobility of your hand but at least when you're going down along this five done you can whip off the first one and i have a new set of gloves straight away at it and it's a very simple idea but it's a, it's a super idea from from the point of going down along at the technique we're doing you you talked about the um the operator having a lot of help but see in the past we would have talked about milking the cows taking a break and maybe going off and having your breakfast and then returning uh, to the parlour to dry off cows. Um, you know, on reflection, um, you know, if we think about how the cow milks and so we milk the cow and then we're taking our break for maybe 30 minutes or an hour. At that point, the cow's teeth end will have closed after milking. Would you recommend that that is what cow farmers will do or should you take your break have identified your cows for dry off, milk them after your break and then dry them off directly. Yeah, Emily, you're dead right. And it's something that's come back from the trial work we've done with, with Moor Park and Kerry on the Selective Dry Co. Is that when farmers came back to do that, the teats had closed and cows get very agitated when you have to put them back into the parlour a second time. Their routine is broken. They know there's something different and they get quite agitated and they'll dung a lot more. Plus the teats are closed now, so it's more difficult to administer with a sealer. So what farmers have found is they draft, they'll milk their cows, they'll draft out their 10, 15 cows that their teat seal only, just teat seal only. They will not be milked. They will go in, if if there's a case there's been a hard morning, they'll go in, they'll get a bit of grub, recharge the batteries and come back. They'll milk five cows, seal those five, then do the next five, seal them, and so and so forth. And the feedback has been very positive from farmers that it's a lot easier to do it. The cows are a lot more settled, and it's easier to do it. You know, there's less pressure on, and definitely they find they, they, they would be a lot more confident that they have a better job done. In 2022, you will no longer be able to use a, a blanket dry cow approach. So say for argument's sake, you had cows with high somatic cell in the year 2022, what would be the approach in order to get uh, antibiotics for those cows? So what they're basically going to do now is that antibiotic, blanket antibiotic uh, therapy will be allowed under veterinary supervision. And so you will be allowed to use antibiotics on a blanket or on a selective based on veterinary supervision, assuming, number one, you have individual cell counts, you have data on individual cows. That means you must be milk according. Number two, you need a culture and a sensitivity to know what bacteria is within the herd and what antibiotics are used. And number three, then, they're looking at the incidence of mastitis within those cows. And based on those three parameters, the veterinary surgeon then will make his call whether um, blanket dry cow is needed or selective dry cow is, is required. And look, finally, just to sum up, Don, I think you've given us a lot of information on how we can best um, complete this uh, dry cow therapy procedure on farms, whether we're going full blanket or selective. Hygiene is the most important thing and making sure there's a lot of help in the parlour. Where we're looking at selective dry cow, we need to be really clear on cows that have had clinical cases. We need good milk recording records and we really need to filter out cows that have low somatic cell across the lactation look you know it, it, it's no bit no different that i'm setting up my farm with grass the way i'm grazing it to get ready for next spring the drying off procedure i'll i'll benefit i'll pay for the consequences all of next lactation and like the three things are be prepared our organization and time and hygiene 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 they are the things Finally, Don, there is some help available for farmers um, through their vet. There is. There's a great initiative through Animal Health Ireland, CellCheck, where through the TASA funding of the, of the Department of Agriculture, if a farmer thinks that he's suitable candidate for selective dry cow, 
there's a free three hour consultation with your veterinary surgeon who will come out to your farm, discuss the pros and cons, the techniques of the selective dry cow. It's free of charge in the sense it's funded by the Department of Agriculture. And it's a fantastic facility for farmers to take advantage of. Any farmer that's considering it, I think it's it's a no brainer to get. It's a great, you have an outside pair of eyes from a professional that will look at your technique and give you guidance on this. And I think it's a no brainer. You go onto the Animal Health Ireland website, cell check, and apply under TASA funding. Or get onto your local Chagas advisor and they'll help you apply for it. That's great. Thank you, John. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to John Crowley for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.